Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, breaking down Texas A&M with uh, Andrew Hattersley. You can join him and the rest of the staff there at 247 Sports. You know the brand. You know the the delivery on top-notch college football coverage. So join him at Gigum 247 We appreciate him running down the 2022 class uh, with Texas A&M looking to get a sixth commit from Bobby Taylor here in the next few weeks. And we're running down the 21 class, which again was a, a top seven in the nation um, rating for Jimbo Fisher and his staff. Uh, all right, we're going to put you to work here, Andrew, starting with uh, Tommy Adelaide a guy that you had mentioned to me just a few minutes ago, uh, originally committed to Ohio State that Jimbo and his staff was able to pull away as a top five uh, strong side defensive end out of, again, there's that uh, town, Katy, Texas. Yeah, so he's a guy, um, A&M was actually his first offer um, way back when it first, when it, when he first um, kind of came on the scene of Katie Tompkins. And um, that really stuck with him down the stretch. He kind of mentioned, you know, to our to our other recruiting writer Brian Peroni, that A um, and M being the first to offer was something that, when it came down to where he wanted to go and and proximity to home, obviously played a factor there as well. Um, really good pass rusher. Um, he actually went to um, IMG this past season and then came back home to Texas and has kind of just been doing online classes. And um, so getting him on campus was was huge to have him go through spring ball and um, kind of an an interesting player that um, has has really toned down his his frame and and can and can kind of play on the outside and you know maybe you can stand him up if you want to but just brings a lot of versatility and and was one of their big uh, when they talked about adding to the defensive line was w one of their big pieces they wanted to add there. Shadrack Banks uh, is a wide receiver who's already on campus there out of Houston, Texas, as well as a top uh, 20 player at his position. Yeah, so that was a that's a big one in in a couple different fronts because we we talked about how AM wants to, you know, kind of get in more and more into the Houston area. It's been a long time since they signed a kid out of North Shore. So just breaking the Breaking breaking the streak and being able to sign a North Shore player is is big for them. Looking at future classes, they have another kid in the 2022 class, Denver Harris, that's also one of the top players in the country. Um, really interesting player that uh, brings some good size. Um, had a really good senior season, and you know he battled some injuries his junior year. He battled some ankle and foot stuff. Um, He's he's got good quickness, but cat, catches the ball well, and just really really a strong player. Got uh, Marcus Burris, uh, who uh, is out of Texarkana. So for people that don't even know the geography of Texas, they can guess where that is. Uh, it's a famous place, of course, on the border. At uh, he's a top ten rated player, a strong side defensive end. So again, Jimbo and his staff are looking to uh, get some rushers to the passer and uh, get to the quarterback there. Yeah, so he's. Um, he missed his senior year due, due to injury, but um, kind of has been has been um, happy with the way things have been progressing injury wise, and had a tremendous him and uh, Landon Jackson, who's going over to LSU, had a tremendous impact on that program. Um, they they see him as a guy that can kind of play both on the outside and the inside, um, and versatility is one of the things that they they were really looking for, especially along the defensive line on guys that can play multiple positions, um, stops to run well. That was a that was a battle between um, A&M and Oklahoma, really, for him. And um, really nice to add. And then another guy that they were on for, for quite a while, and, and, and Terry Price really did a good job kind of building that relationship, staying on it, and, uh, you know, kind of showing that persistence that, that ended up paying off. Texas A&M, of course, looking for the replacement for Kellen Mond here in 2021. This is probably not the guy quite yet, but uh, Eli Stowers, uh, seventh-rated uh, dual-threat quarterback coming out of uh, Texas again, uh, number 168 in the nation, uh, top 30 in the state. Yeah, he. Um, the first thing that stands out about him is his athleticism. He's a He was a really good high jumper in at Den Geyer, um, and you know, is, is your prototypical kind of dual threat quarterback. Really, he can, he can break free in the, in the open field. He's, he's got to become a more consistent passer. And I think that's, 
that's one of the things when you look at Jimbo Fisher, he'll he'll kind of work with him on that and work on his motion and, and, and work on his delivery and, and help him become more consistent. Uh, bounce back from a knee injury that he suffered in the state time as a junior um, and got Den Geyer back to the playoffs this past year. And he's already on campus, and I think that will really benefit him to go through a go through a spring and, and be involved in that that quarterback battle with Haynes King, who's already on campus and has had a year, and Zach Calzada. And uh, I think those are the three right now that will be kind of battling it out couple of guys already on campus uh, coming all the way from the East Coast. So you would think uh, Texas A&M, Texas being arguably the best football playing state in the nation. We just need to stay home. But hey, if there's a player out there and uh, of course, Texas A&M and Jimbo have the national brand, bring him in from Philadelphia. Elijah Judy, you had mentioned him earlier as uh, number 13 rated a weak side defensive end and uh, top 10 player in the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah, so um, A&M has been, they've, under Elijah Robinson, they've kind of been looking towards that East Coast area a little bit more, um, and he's got some ties there to Penn State, and and kind of, um, you know, I think he, he, you know he's got some ties to Temple as well. So he's kind of got that Philly, New Jersey region. Um, there's a couple other players there that he was he was involved with as well. Really good passwords. I was actually committed to Georgia originally, and then reopened his recruitment and. Um, announced his decision on Dren, kind of the All-American Bowl special that they had in, in mid-January. Um, and he just another guy that kind of is part of that D-line hall that they had. You don't see this uh, very often amongst uh, top high school football recruits. Uh, the state of New York plays pretty decent high school football, but most of them are up near Syracuse or Albany or somewhere. Brooklyn, New York with... Uh, Josian Harris, a second rated player in the state, is a weak side defensive end as well. Yeah, so he, um, another guy that was connected to um, Elijah Robinson and came down on a visit to AM and really just clicked with the entire coaching staff. And his recruitment was, was pretty quiet. He just, he, he announced his decision in the spring. Um, New York didn't, they didn't have their season in, during the fall, but his junior year, that defense, essentially didn't give up a point the second half of the year. Um, and he was obviously a big piece to that. And uh, I think he was, he was kind of one that was weighing, do I kind of wait till the spring and see if we can have a senior season or, or end up enrolling early and, and getting going at A&M. And I think, I think they're really excited about, about getting him on campus and, and, and getting to work with him. Need corners in college football, of course, more and more as uh, these offenses become more and more uh, prolific. Uh, you come back to the Lone Star State, 15th rated um, cornerback in the nation and Deuce Harmon. Yeah, so he is a guy that the past year or so has really improved as a player. He um, He's teammates, obviously, with Eli Stowers, and um, his ball skills have just gotten so much better over the past year he kind of went from being a player that was you know was a good cover guy and and had speed for days to a guy that was forcing turnovers and and finding other ways to get in the mix and forcing fumbles and um i think the AM staff is is really 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 excited about him they kind of got on him before he really took off um it was a really good scouting job on um, he got the offer from Mo Ling Maurice Linguist uh, before he left for the Cowboys, but then TJ Rushing kind of took right off um, when he arrived, and they were, he was a huge priority for them. And um, really, really liked that ad in the secondary. I think he has a chance to to be a guy just in terms of speed and the and the way his frame is right now contribute very early. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. This is what we do each and every day. You know that 24 7, 365. There is no down season for college football here. We talk it up every day. We got Andrew Hattersley on the line from Gigum 247 Sports. Please join him and the rest of the staff, of course, 247 Sports, the industry standard. If you want to cover and uh, follow Texas AM here in the 2022 classes, we run down a 21. Uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, of course, is the home of Colorado State, but Trey Zoon got away as a top 20 offensive tackle. Yeah, so he um, he has some family down in the College Station area, and they do um, – they couldn't do it this past time, but they did it last year where they do sort of a Super Bowl party um, 
host guys for a junior day and they, you know, tour campus and all that. And uh, Trey Zoon ended up committing at the end of the end of the night um, after his conversation with the staff and another another guy. A M really needed to kind of bolster the offensive line in this cycle. They've lost four seniors from this past offensive line, um, and so kind of needed to reload reload in that department. And um, I think he brings some good athleticism. He's coming off an injury as well. Um, so we'll see whether he's able to do anything in, you know, kind of the late spring, summer time frame. But um, really like that ad and just the athleticism that he brings. And one of the things that Jimbo Fisher mentioned with a lot of guys in the in this offensive line class is their versatility to play both tackle and guard. And, and um, in, today's, in today's game, you know, you try to just find the best five that you can put out there. And so I think that versatility – was something he was really excited about. Absolutely. And Texas A&M, of course, boasted one of the best offensive line groups in the nation here uh, in 2020. And you got another one coming in uh, from Texas uh, with Matthew Wyckoff. Yeah, so he's a guy, um, again, speaking of versatility, um, they've kind of talked with him about, you know, playing, you know, you, we could use you on the interior, we could use you on the – the um, out of tackle and he's really grown into his frame the past couple of months and had a really good senior season. Um, probably kind of flew under the radar a little bit um, just based on the season that he had. Um, he's kind of, it seems like a guy that's kind of trending upwards and, and maybe isn't a guy that'll contribute the first year and, you know, maybe, maybe he's another redshirt year to, you know, continue adding to his frame, get stronger. Um, and then a guy down the line that is it could end up being a really nice piece that you can use all over the offensive line. The Yankees go back to Philadelphia and a three-star in Tyreek uh, Chapel, 49th rated player at his position, another corner here, 15th rated uh, in the Keystone State. Yeah, so he's actually good friends as well with um, Elijah Judy, and so that's a nice kind of comfort for both of them. Ty- Tyreek Chapel had actually never been down to Texas before his um, – before he enrolled at the school. And so that was, that was one thing he was kind of the night, you know, the night before and in the weeks leading up was kind of curious what Texas was even going to be like. Um, so he relied a little bit on Elijah Judy in terms of, you know, what does the campus look like? What's Texas like? Um, I'm really, I'm very high on him and he, he's a guy that again, didn't have his, uh, didn't have his senior year. They didn't play this past fall. And, he basically used that as an opportunity to, you know, accelerate in the classroom and be able to graduate early. And he just decided that was what was best for him to be able to get on campus and get in a college weight room, you know, and and get a jump on, on trying to, you know, make an, make an impact as a freshman. And I think the first thing that jumps out with him is his speed. He's a really, really fast player, good length, um, we need to add to his frame, uh, but that'll help getting in a college weight room. Um, but when you look back maybe two years down the line, I could see him being possibly one of the steals of this class. When you talk to people in the Philadelphia area, they they absolutely love him. They love his work ethic. They love the way he works and everything, and just how he approaches everything. I th- I think he has a chance to be really good. All right. Well, here's a unique one as we get to the guys that are coming in uh, during the summer session uh, because the five stars don't fill up very often. You mentioned the number 32 here recently, and that's usually the range about at which uh, we've got the number of five stars somewhere in that 30 to 40 range. So correct me if I'm wrong here, Andrew, if you look at the top 300 for any of the major services, uh, you're still in a four star category once you hit 300 typically right you still pretty much yeah probably have another 50 or 100 players that fit that four star range but when you go to five star there's not uh those guys aren't like standing on every street corner there aren't too many of those guys uh nationally so uh shamir uh turner shamar turner don't want to mess up his name here uh a defensive tackle is elite obviously yeah i think I've had a chance up in the at the Dallas area to see him quite a few times, and he he really impacts the game in a, in a number of ways. And DeSoto had a really good offensive line this this past cycle. They had you know Byron Murphy. He ended up at Texas, and the, 
the two of them together was just really a load to stop. And there's, there's, there's so many things that stand out to you about Jamar Turner. The first is just how strong he is. I mean, he's just overpowers offensive linemen a, a lot of time, but he's really, really quick as well, really athletic. And that allows him to, you know, kind of react to, to different stuff in the run game and, and kind of be a guy that's just all over the place. He even caught, you know, they even have used him on offense at times. And, you know, you, you see him take a fumble return back and just how quickly he he explodes off. And um, that was a real battle down the stretch between um, Texas was in the mix, Alabama was in the mix, Georgia, LSU. Um, and, you know, I think that when we talk about the Florida game back in the fall, I think that was when really – things shifted with, with, with him when he saw the season that they were able to put together, especially what they did on the, the defensive line. And if you look at a guy like DeMarvin Leal, who's currently on A&M's roster, um, they, they see him as kind of a guy that can do a lot of the same things. And they, they are through the moon excited to get him. And, and you can understand why as, as, as soon as you see him play. LT Johnson's a guy that uh, you had mentioned before. People are really excited about him as the fourth rated running back in the nation, number 45 player overall out of uh, Cypress, Texas. Yeah. So that was a, that was a battle down the stretch between Texas and, and Texas A&M and um, kind of went right up until, right up until signing day before he was, he was just, you know, really weighing and weighing both of those options. And um Given where A and M's running back room is right now, you wouldn't necessarily think that running back was a need, but adding a player like him to Isaiah Spiller, Devon Achain, uh, they used Anaya Smith in the backfield as well. Have a couple others as well in Ernest Crownover and Darvin Hubbard, and I think you know when you look past Isaiah Spiller, this is kind of the next guy that I think they're looking to fill in there and. Um, the one thing it allows them to do is really split carries and, and, you know, kind of manage the workloads for all, all the different guys. And with LJ Johnson, he can do so many different things as well. It, you know, he can kind of run between the tackles, but he's also an effective receiver out of the backfield and, um, big, big landed, uh, guy that they've really coveted for the last year or so. I've got a pretty good idea where Katy, Texas is. It's about what, about 20 or 25 miles, uh, west of houston and uh you got uh bryce foster i keep seeing these katie texas kids and i'm thinking uh, what is like uh, every other uh in the population uh a four star out of there you got bryce foster as a uh top 15 i'm sorry a top five guard yeah so he's he's really a a, a fun player to kind of cover and, and watch really really physical player he uh, um, that's one of the first things he, he kind of comes into the, he kind of comes in college ready, to be honest with you in terms of, um, strength wise. And he's also a really good track athlete. He's going to do track at A&M as well. Um, and when you look at A&M having a place for, for offensive linemen, he's a guy that can probably physically come in and compete right away for, for starting time. Not saying he's going to start, but. Um, he's a guy that can at least be in the mix and compete and, and add depth at that position. And that was a real battle between Oklahoma and A&M. I think it was, it was pretty much those two. Oregon was in the mix as well. Um, but this is, this was obviously, uh, Josh Henson's second recruiting cycle. And he, this is one of his biggest wins he's had at A&M so far, just from a recruiting standpoint and being able to go toe to toe with Bill Biedenbaugh. Um, and was kind of one that you kind of had to ride the waves of a recruitment that for a, for a while it looked like he was heading to o Oklahoma over the summer. They had kind of the edge, but with family ties to the area, to the school and, and all that, I think in the end that that played the big part and then just being able to stay close to home. And um, I think the season at A&M put together made, made a big difference as well. If, you know, if they don't put the season that they put together, you know, who, who knows if he really ends up, at a and but I just a really good job by, by Josh Henson and on that recruitment and staying with it and, and staying on him. Basically next door to Katy, Texas, you got Richmond, Texas close by and you got to Ruben Fatherer. 
Did, did I mess up his name there? Uh, Ruben Fathery. Fathery. I, yeah. My eyes are failing me here. Let me back up on this one. So pretty much next door to Katy, Texas, you got Richmond, you got Ruben Fathery, and uh, another offensive tackle prospect is a top 15 player in the state, top 15 player uh, at that uh, position. Yeah, so him and uh, him and Bryce Foster are actually really good friends as well. And you kind of talk about the Houston connections that are in the 2022 class. Some of those are also the case in the 2021 class. When you talk about Ruben Fathery and Bryce Foster and LJ Johnson, um, those guys are all really, really close. And, and Tanmisa Adelaide is in that mix as well. Um, he's a really good basketball player as well. He's, he's right in the midst of his senior season right now. And you really see that athleticism show up in terms of his footwork and just what he's able to do um, moving and, and, and just his athleticism to cover a lot of ground um, is really impressive. He's going to have to get, you know, stronger, especially on the lower, lower base, but that'll, that'll be, um, you know, kind of the benefit of, of maybe not having to play right away. He can kind of take a year to get into the weight room, but I think his ceiling's really high just in, just from the basketball front and what he can do footwork wise. And, and where he can go. This can't sit uh, too well with Lincoln Riley, the number one player in the state of Oklahoma. Safety Kendall uh, Daniels moves on to play for Texas A&M as the fifth-rated player uh, at his position, and again, the number one player in the uh, Sooner State. Yeah, so that versatility, again, right, is is one of the things that gets mentioned with him, and, and one of the things Jimbo Fisher talked about was his length and athleticism to be able to cover tight ends. And um, he also played on the offensive side of the ball at, at Beggs and was a really good offensive player there. Um, and the the thing about him is um, they they kind of view him as a safety. There was kind of a talk about whether he'd be a linebacker, whether he'd be a safety. I think for right now they really like him at safety and they, and they like the length that he provides there. Um, and, a M did a really good job in this class, kind of going out of state to, to supplement the talent that they needed, especially in the secondary. Um, I know we'll get to to Drayden Norwood in a little bit as well, but just kind of supplementing the Deuce Harmon addition was being able to go out of state and, and get some other guys. Talking about uh, out-of-state talent, this is the first one that pops up from uh, the Sunshine State, uh, Miami's Amari Daniels, fourth-rated uh, all-purpose back. And uh, with what uh, some of the explosive players that Texas A&M has um, kind of in that role right now, it should be interesting to see how he's used 35th rated player out of Florida. Yeah, so I think him and um, him and LJ Johnson actually complement each other pretty well. They met at a at an A&M camp about over a year ago, and they they kind of talked at that at that time about how they how their games kind of complement each other. Um, obviously having coached at Florida state, Jimbo Fisher still has a lot of connections down there and, and some other members of the staff do as well. And Ishmael or who is an analyst that has done a really good job in the region and, um, just kind of adding, adding, adding a lot to this, to the staff while not being able to be in an on-field coaching role and James Coley as well. They kind of had a group effort of, of, of pursuing, um, and Tommy Robinson as well, who's the running backs coach, um, kind of had a group effort pursuing Amari Daniels, and he was a guy that they really wanted um, can can fill a number of different roles. And as we talk about, you know, some of the best places to play football, obviously Florida's got some pretty competitive schools as well. And Jimbo Fisher talked about it when you look at the production that he had down in Florida. I mean that 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 is really impressive and, and, and something they really liked. We are putting uh, Andrew Hattersley to work here, Gigum 247 Sports. So join him and the rest of the staff over there for the deep dive on Texas A&M football coverage, running through the 2021 class, another top 10 uh, effort for Jimbo Fisher at number seven in the 247 rankings. And um, this is the first time we've stumbled upon Louisiana. Uh, last I've checked, uh, per capita uh, produces the most NFL players of any state in the nation. Jarden Gilbert, uh, a safety, 18th rated in the country, number nine in the state of Louisiana. Yeah, so you talk about kind of getting in on a guy early. They offered him last spring and just really kept that relationship going. He he didn't kind of share a lot about where his recruitment was or, or where 
where things kind of stood. And so it was hard to really get a picture during the fall about where a and stood or, or, or whether they were going to pursue him. Um, but I think that early relationship really ended up paying off because a couple weeks before signing day, um, LSU ended up offering, and then it kind of turned into a, you know an LSU A and M battle. But I think that the the time that A and M had spent kind of recruiting him the past few months had put them in a really strong spot to withstand kind of the, the late LSU push. And um, really good job by Tommy Robinson. He was he was one that has some connections, obviously being being from Louisiana before, but. Mike Alco and and Ishmael Aristide and and Jimbo Fisher was in there as well. Just kind of built a real comfort with that family. Which uh, when you look at Darden Gilbert, one of the things that he was looking for was relationships and and, and a comfort with the coaching staff. And and AM, AM did a really good job on on that front, just being able to build that trust and be, and build that relationship with him. Jimbo Fisher and his staff able to get. Uh the second rated player out of New York, two top 10 players out of Pennsylvania, the number one rated player in the state of Oklahoma and Arkansas certainly needs to hang on to its best players, but the number one player in the state, Drayden Norwood gets away to Texas A&M as uh, the 34th rated cornerback in the country. Yeah. So he's an interesting player too. And um, another player that kind of really quiet, kind of kept his recruitment to himself and then sort of on a, on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock when, when everybody's getting ready for the weekend, kind of just put his, put his tweet out that he had committed to A&M. And um, he's an interesting player because he was a, he was a quarterback in high school. Um, didn't play a ton of defensive back as the, as time went along because they wanted to make sure they were managing reps. But um, in talking with his coaching staff around there, they kind of split the, the practice reps up where one day he would do quarterback the next day, Defensive back, quarterback, defensive back, and um, I know the A and M's really high on his athleticism and kind of that that aspect of going from playing quarterback to defensive back and and being able to read coverages and and know what a, where a quarterback might look to go and what he might be looking to do is something they really like about him and um, it'll take him some time to to grow into being fully comfortable in that position I think and. Uh, probably going to be a little bit of patience required, but um, kind of an intriguing prospect to follow. Miami Central's a powerhouse in football down in South Florida. Yul Keith Brown is rated an athlete there, and you'll have to correct me on the pronunciation of his first name if I mess that up. But uh, anytime you see that athlete um, classification, Andrew, of course, uh, it typically spells either wide receiver or DB. Yeah, so they kind of view him as the second wide receiver in this class along with Shadrick Banks and um, a guy that can play in the slot and a guy that can play maybe even running back as well. A good comp right now is um, Anaya Smith and and he's already on campus and um, coming off a really good year. And they kind of showed, showed Yo Keith what they did with, with Anaya Smith and, and to help paint a picture about this is where, you know, we kind of envision you fitting into this offense and, um, Another guy that very productive in a in you know in a tough region of football. He's also teammates with Amari Daniels, so the two of them kind of have a comfort. There was a thought originally that they might um, enroll early, which which would have helped to have them, I think, go through the spring. Uh, but they'll be coming in this summer. But they they definitely view him on the offensive side of the ball and kind of in that slot receiver mold. Texas A&M grabs the number one player in the state of Arkansas, Oklahoma, now Utah. You got uh, Jordan Spasajevic, Moko. Uh, he's a offensive tackle, number one rated player again in the state and also at his position. Uh, yep. So I'm thinking that's a junior college guy. Yeah, so here's an interesting one for you, actually. He's actually from Australia. Um, and so he's just picking up the game of football now. He was a rugby player. Um, and was supposed to play last fall at Snow College out in Utah, but obviously their season didn't didn't happen. So he has um, he's been back home in Australia working. Um, he actually made his commitment last week Friday at for those that stayed up. It was at two a.m. in the morning. It was six p.m. their time, and so um, you know, a kind of a, a 
athleticism is the first thing that jumps off the page with him. Um, really athletic player, obviously having played rugby, but um, he's going to, he's going to need some time to learn the position. But one of the things that he really talked about was, you know, obviously Jimbo Fisher had Bjorn Werner when he was at Florida state um, and his history of developing international players and players that were maybe new to the game of football. Um, he he really liked that, and it, it was down to A and M, LSU, Oregon, um, Auburn was in the mix as well. And um, he uh, he's he's going to be a fun player to see how where he ends up going. One of the one of the best commitment ceremonies I've I've seen to see them doing the haka and and all that. And um, I, I I think that was that was kind of a nice late ad and and a guy that you really just don't you you don't know what you have right and. And you get to kind of mold him how, where you where where you think he can go, and and he should be a fun player to watch. What you have is obviously a unique combination of size and athleticism for the, that list of schools to be going over uh, after a student athlete who hasn't played football. Yeah. So when his workout videos started coming out, I think that was when programs really started to see him. Um, and he his recruitment really took off kind of in the in the mid to late fall and and um, it kind of when you play the it, sometimes it happens in recruiting when you play the game of where one school finds them and then everybody else starts to kind of fall, play follow the leader and um, his he, you know there's a video of him dunking a basketball of, that that came out just before signing day and you can really there's so much athleticism there to work with that if you can get him in a weight room and, and teach him the game and teach him where, you know, all the different things that come with playing football. I mean, he, he could end up being a really high upside player down the road. Two, four, seven sports has uh, Remington Strickland listed as the eighth best uh, center in the country. Uh, he's an in-state guy out of Sugarland, uh, again, in the Houston area, there is a uh, top 60 player in the state. Yeah, so he he brings some versatility as well, kind of an interior guy that can play guard, center. Um, and that was another battle down the stretch between Oklahoma and A&M. Um, he ended up taking a visit to A&M and just really loved it, um, felt comfortable on the campus. Um, I believe he has family that, that, that went there, so he, he has a good sense of the school. And um, that one came together pretty quickly before before signing day. and. I know there was some that were worried, you know, is this a sign about where Bryce Foster is going or all that? But AM just really liked what he brought to the table. And when you talk about building depth along the offensive line, the more guys that you can accumulate, the better. Albert Regis is another Texas signee as a defensive tackle, number 28 at his position. And uh, he's roughly a top 60 player uh, in the state as well. Yeah, so interesting prospect. He was first uh, committed to Minnesota and then reopened his recruitment and really saw it took off. A&M was among the schools that offered him. Texas offered him. I believe Baylor offered him. SMU offered him. Um, and he's played He's played a little bit of everywhere, actually. He played some tight end this year. He played some, some you know, all across the defensive line. Um, and I think that athleticism is something that a and really excited about. Um, and we'll, we'll see once he gets on campus if he's able to contribute early or if he needs some time. But um, they've got a deep defensive line, so they can afford to take a guy like that and, and, and really see, you know build depth and, and, and be patient with him. And, uh, but they, re they really like his athleticism and, and versatility. And one of the themes with this class is they, they seem to really be attracted to guys that play um, both – both sides of the ball, so defense and offense, and just those ball skills, and um, those guys seem to really pique their interest as guys that they wanted in this class. Texas A&M boasted uh, a tight end tandem this past year that was probably as good as any in the country. Uh, we go back to Katy, Texas. Fernando Garcia is a tight end, uh, the 100th rated player in the state. Yeah, so he, um, he was another one that uh, – Kind of his recruitment was was pretty much spanned about a week when he got the A and M offer and and just really loves the school, wanted to stay close to home, loves the offense, loves what the coaching staff is doing there, and um, 
decided to stay home and and kind of turned into a an, into, into a recruiting role with um, um, recruiting Malik Silla and and Bobby Taylor and all of his teammates and he's pushing to get obviously Taylor in the in the, in the coming weeks. Um, coming off an injury, suffered an injury during his senior season, so we'll see where where he is health wise. But um, just an a guy that I think A&M likes what he can do in the run game and, and, and what he brings to the table there. So finally, Andrew, uh, Demetrius uh, Crownover, what's the story with him? He committed back in October. Of course, National Signing Day was in December. Then the second one here in February. Is uh, is he still, is there any concern that uh, he's going to get away? No, so he's, he's supposed to come this summer. Um, and I think... He's an interesting player because he kind of played along the defensive line and and tight end. Um, they they've actually also you know mentioned him possibly being you know an offensive lineman, and I think that could be a really good fit for him in terms of his athleticism and his frame. He's are he's already up to uh, two seventy five, and um, so I think he could be an off you know an intriguing offensive lineman option down the road. Um, if he can kind of fill out a little bit more and um, that might be where he brings the highest upside. Uh, but yeah, he's expected on this summer and, and no concerns there. Okay. Good stuff. Um, and then they also added um, just in the past couple of days as well, one transfer from uh, Tennessee, um, Jameer Johnson, where just going back to that, you know, the, the point about them losing the four starters along the offensive line, he's, started a you know double digit games in the sec already so they just kind of brought that you know they wanted that depth of you know a guy that had some playing experience um to to you know add add some experience he's a graduate transfer so he'll be able to play immediately um and i i think a, an important late add just 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 to give you a little more comfort along the offensive line absolutely Andrew Hattersley doing a great job for us here, breaking down the 21 and 22 classes as they stand right now. A couple top 10 finishes for Jimbo Fisher, of course, uh, in his first few seasons at Texas A&M, coming off uh, a fine nine and one season. Andrew, uh, we appreciate you stopping by. Appreciate all the hard work you've done for us. And again, encourage everybody else to stop on over to Gigum 247 Sports to check out Andrew and the rest of the staff there. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on.